I've given this talk to many, many physicists, uh, but it has, in my view, interesting connotations because the original ideas behind it uh, started by thinking on, on conceptual grounds that you may sympathize with. Uh, this is part of an ongoing program. Not, we don't have all the answers, we have not dotted all the dots, we don't we still have many levels of you know many issues that require a deeper level of study, many issues on all which we are not completely clear, and I would try not to hide anything, but at the same time present the thing in the most coherent fashion I can. So the plan of the talk is this general overview of our approach to the quantum, the gravity quantum interface. And I emphasize gravity slash quantum instead of quantum gravity because I'm going to you know not be postulating a theory of quantum gravity or something of that sort. And as, as I will show you, this will take us to the point in which we take make to make sense of semi-classical gravity together with collapse theories. That is a situation that, that is delicate. The theories do not seem to want to go together. So if you want to work consistently in that, in, 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 in that context, you need to do something uh, creative. And then I'm going to tell you about a version of, of the theories. This, we, we, we may have a, a approaches to deal uh, uh, with, let's say, individual situations, collapse by collapse, individual cases. But, but of course, if you are going to deal with something realistic, some realistic problem, you have to create some scheme in which you can, you know, really do calculations and you hope that that scheme would represent in some sense, in an average way, something of this sort or, or, or some approximation, some reasonable approximation. And then I'm going to, to tell you about this, this interesting version of gravitation called unimodular gravity. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about uh, the ideas that we have developed regarding the possibility of space-time discreteness that doesn't seem to match very clearly, at least with, with, with some of these uh, uh, previous topics, but, but uh, I'll try to, 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 to explain how we, we have come to this, to this view. <clears throat> and then I will show you that if you put all these things together, you end up with a way to generate and predict quote unquote the effective value of the cosmological constant. <clears throat> and then we'll be in the discussion, if we at the end have time for discussions, well, what are, I would like to know what, you know, other people think about what could be the implications of, of these ideas, uh, and in particular, in connection with this conference, with this uh, school or workshop, if there are uh, issues that will arise in a world where we have entropy without Really, without conservation laws, and well, whether in particular something would be relevant for the issue of black hole entropy in particular, which, as I said in my previous talk, is something we are really confused about. Okay, so what is our approach to exploration of the GR quantum theory uh, interface? We approach that in what we call a bottom up approach, and that should be contrasted with the standard approach, which we have called it the top-down approach, which start by postulating your complete theory. You start by assuming you have give, been given the complete theory of quantum gravity, string theory, loop quantum gravity, cosmic set, or any of these approaches. And then, starting from that fundamental theory, that presumably is well-defined, not always is clear, but presumably is a well-defined theory, you try to approach regimes in the world that are that are of you know regimes that are of interest to the real world out there you will try to apply the cosmology black holes etc our approach <coughs> goes in the opposite way 
We do not assume that we have in our hands a uh, quantum gravity theory, and instead what we'll try to do is push what theories that we know work, work, work well, that is in particular GR and quantum field theories on, on, on curved space-time, and to push them uh, to explore regimes where, where they need to start to fail and try to make guesses about how these failures could be fixed, hoping that by understanding this and hopefully actually finding out what, what is the effective way in which these problems become solved, uh, you will get some clues that will be useful eventually in the construction of the fundamental theory of quantum gravity. So it's a, it's a very different philosophy, if you want to call. Allow me to use the word. Okay, but the, this idea, of course, is this, this approach is not new. There, there are, is represented by previous uh, programs. One of them was called quantum gravity phenomenology. It was very popular around 10, 15 years ago where people were interested in the possibility that there was space-time granularity that modified the dispersion relations of high-energy cosmic rays and high-energy uh, and, 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 uh, and high energy photons. And people were then dedicated to the whole time to studying those, those uh, uh, phenomena, the phenomena related to that, and to try to get, <coughs> let's say, bounds on the type of modifications of, of the dispersion relations. Uh, the dispersion relation, by the way, is the relation between energy and momentum of a particle, that's of, or of a moment, or of any excitation that you, that you have. Uh, this uh, whole approach, in fact, connects with a much older and systematic approach that is a uh, uh, program uh, started and held by, by uh, Alan Kostlecki, in which you look consistently and methodically for all possible Lorentz valid, Lorentz variations uh, that can be incorporated into, within the standard model. So you add, consider the standard model of particle physics, and you add terms that relate explicitly Lorentz invariance relation, and you say, well, what can I say from phenomenology about these terms? And the idea is to start bounding, putting bounds on those terms. So it's, it's, that's a very old program, at least perhaps 30 years old. So one of our encounters, encounters with this, uh, with this uh, line of research was uh, within this, this uh, quantum gravity phenomenology uh, program, which was the idea that there was somehow a preferred frame associated with the granularity of space-time. So people imagine a space-time actually made out of little grains and a preferred frame in which these grains would look, let's like, say, isotropic. If they look, if you have a frame in which they look at isotropic, then in general, in other frames due to Lorentz transformations, they would not look isotropic, so that would be a preferred frame. So we took this idea seriously and we uh, considered the following statement. If there are grains and there is nothing in between the grains, then you should remove from the theory all modes that have wavelengths that are shorter than, the, than your grains. That, that's the whole story of Einstein and the Bay and blah, blah. Okay, so we take it now and apply it to, to space-time. And the important thing here is that means introducing a, a cutoff on the theory or removal of modes, high-energy modes, but these modes are of a certain wavelength or shorter in a preferred frame. So it's a very special type of cutoff. It's a frame-dependent cutoff which is in contrast with what is normally done. I mean, in their calculations in which people put a cutoff, but they, if they are careful, they should not make it frame dependent. Okay, so this is a frame dependent cutoff, and the result of the analysis that, that we carry out, we said, well, what would happen with radiative corrections if you make such a cutoff? And what we found is that these radiative corrections that are supposed to produce very small terms actually produce very large terms. Ter terms that are so large that we would have seen them. Surprisingly, in the, the leading terms are independent of the size of the crystal. So not, not, only, not, not only something at the Planck scale is ruled out, it's ruled out anything a million times, a, a, a million of a times the Planck scale. Any 
such cutoff would show up producing extremely large effects. And that seems, seems extremely serious you, 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 you. <coughs> because you cannot do it your normal game saying, OK, yes, perhaps this things exist, but this has a higher, still higher energy. No, this will not save you. The only known way to address that is to commit to uh, fine-tuning specially designed counterterms. You would have to add by hand into your theory specially designed counterterms for all the possible ways in which this would show up and adjust them precisely so that they would cancel these huge terms. That's the only way. I just want to make clear what you're saying. So you're examining what would happen if you eliminate wavelengths shorter than L crisp. In a particular frame. In a particular frame. And then the leading terms are independent of the value of L crisp. Yep. OK, I believe you because I believe you did the calculation correctly. That sounds, sounds amazing. OK. OK, let me, let me give you some matters. If you want later, I can give you a, but Somebody that can give you intuition a bit about, about, about this, I think. But I think at least there is an analogy. Think about Euler's paradox. Mm -hmm. In a stationary universe, you know, the, <coughs> the, if it's infinite, the day would be equal to mm -hmm. the night. If it's infinite. If it's finite, it doesn't matter how, you know, then there is a way to adjust things so that this does not happen. So infinite versus finite is dramatically different, right? And in infinite universe, you would find the center. You could, you, the infinite, there is no center. In any finite universe, isotropic, there is a center. Okay. So, but okay, but if you want, we can I can show you the calculations. Those are the leading terms. Then there are higher terms. Than so the problematic thing is that, is that okay? So, so that is in this, in this, in this page. So the lesson we started from this experience is if there is anything like a, like discreteness, anything like a discrete structure in space-time, it should not select globally a preferential frame. The most it can do is that they could appear in a kind of relational way. They can appear if there is a bunch of matter that is creating, defining a gravitational environment, and you have other matter moving with respect to this first type of matter. In, under those conditions, you could create, have a granularity, and not be subjected to this, to this problem. Okay? Because that is not that, then you don't have to, you know, rule out, uh, remove the modes in this global way, but you would have to remove modes depending on the experiment you're doing. And this is more compatible with the standard type of cutoff that is introduced, for instance, in a scattering experiment. <clears throat> this actually led us to, to look for new ideas of quantum gravity phenomenology. The, the basic ideas of quantum gravity phenomenology, the new type of quantum gravity phenomenology we, we did were the following. You imagine that let me make an analogy. Again, I'm going to be feeling a lot of stuff with analogies because we, I, I start by saying I don't know what the hell the quantum gravity, what quantum gravity theory of gravity is. So I'm going to be working, be guiding myself a lot by an analogy. So let me think of the following analogy. Imagine that you have tiles that are designed to produce filled flat floors. And as they are designed to produce flat, flat floors. When you try to tile a flat floor, they match perfectly, and you produce a flat floor. And this floor, you cannot actually see the junctions between the tiles. So you, you are in a situation in which the tiles will not manifest themselves in any way. If you roll a ball through that floor, it will roll as if the floor was 100% flat. Now, imagine trying to use the same type of tiles to cover a a floor that is curved. Then the tiles will show up, the granularity will show up, and when you throw a ball, this ball is going to start scattering through the, you know, 
borders of these tiles that, pro that pro pro protrude, and then you're going to start seeing something. So this is the basic idea that curvature, matter will create curvature, curvature may force this granular structure to become manifest, and then you could look for it. <clears throat> because the tiles are flat. Because tiles are flat, and when you, when you have a flat space time, then you don't feel the tiles. When you have forced the space time to be curved, there it comes. <clears throat> so this is, yes? Uh, so the framework you're working with here is a sort of semi-classical framework? Yeah, we are, we are going to be working in semi-classical framework, but, but this idea is, it's a motivational idea, okay? So take it only as that. We just make analogies and, and, and then do it. So you start with this thing and then you try to write, a, like, you try, for instance, to write a Lagrangian like, term that you could introduce into your standard model. That is, number one, made out of curvature connects to the matter you are going to use as flows. So for instance, you have fermions. I want to do an experiment with fermions. How could this thing manifest itself? What kind of term can I construct out of curvature that would couple to fermions in, in, in a way that is natural if you have this idea behind your mind? And that it would disappear when the space then is flat. Okay? So this is the story, and then you actually write the term, and then you say, okay, how would I look for this term? And actually, in this case, an experiment was done to look for the term we were looking for, and they were able to put very, you know, stringent constraints on one. Okay. So the point is that we want, in our, in our, in our approach, a bottom-up approach, as I said, we have two theories that we are very confident we can trust them to a high degree, not to an infinite degree, but to a very high degree, which are GR and quantum field theory, in particular quantum field theory in curved space-time. So in particular, the program is tied to a renewed focus, renewed, and I will explain why, why renewed, why it didn't need to be renewed on semi-classical gravity, which is the idea that you will treat gravity in a classical language and quantum field all matter in terms of their quantum field characterization. And therefore, if you do that, Einstein's equations will have to be of this form. Right? You will I equate the Einstein tensor of the of the curve space-time to the vacuum to the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor. <clears throat> Again, we don't view this as a fundamental theory. We only view this as a step in our type of approach, trying to push that regime which, in which we put together two things that we understand fairly well, but which don't really match very well. Okay, so other people have created programs similar to this. There is a, something called the Stochastic Gravity Program by Vieira Hu and, and, and Enrique Verdaguer. Uh, it has some similarities to what we do, but, but, but also very, very important distinctions, and I may mention them. But the problem is that before, even before you start entertaining this program, and actually I'm here a little bit dishonest here because we didn't solve this issue before, we didn't address it before, we said, let's go ahead and see what happens. <coughs> you have to deal with a very serious problem. And the problem <coughs> starts by noting that the interface between quantum theory and gravitation need not involve the Planck regime. You may expect strange things to happen even well before you get into the Planck regime. For instance, imagine trying to create the superposition, the, 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 the space-time corresponding to an object that is in a superposition of being here and here. Moon superimposed beer here, being there, what's the space time? It becomes problematic. You, you may, write, may write down the equations, but then what you do with them is a problem. There is actually a, a, a famous paper, perhaps it's more famous than it should be, but it's famous anyway, by, by Page and Blaker, uh, in which they 
consider an experiment. They claim to have made an experiment. I don't doubt that they did something that is, you know. But let me not get into the details of, the, of, the, of what, what they did. But in, in, in which they tried to create a superposition of an object being in two locations, and then use a, a pendulum, a torsion pendulum, to detect the gravitational field of this object. <coughs> the conclusion of their experiment, they tried to create this superposition, they say if, they, if the thing remains in a superposition, the, thing will, the, the pendulum will, will swing in one direction or the other. Uh, if they remain in superposition, it will remain in the middle by symmetry. And they carried out the experiment, and of course, the pendulum swung to one side. And then their conclusion from the experiment is the following. If there is no quantum collapse, i.e. the situation remains, you know, you have an actual superposition and the thing remains in the superposition, there is no reason for the pendulum to swing, and then you are in conflict with the experiment. So no collapses, conflict with the experiment. During a collapse, the divergence of the energy momentum tensor will not be not vanish. And that makes the theory compatible with the fact that this side of the Einstein's equation vanishes automatically. This is called the Bianchi identity. So you, if you write Einstein's equations by equating this object to this object, so the conclusion is no collapses, conflict with experiment, yes collapses, inconsistency, throw the theory to the garbage and forget about it. So how do we deal with such? Well, that statement is correct if you view semi-classical gravity as an strict theory that has to be absolutely valid. But as I said, we don't do that. We are seeing this semi-classical approach as some step into something that at the, must exist at a deeper level, which is, a, let's call it quantum gravity, which I don't know what it is. What is clear is that whatever this quantum gravity is, then if it's, it's going to be successful empirically, is going to eventually have to derive GR. So at some point, it has to. So our guess is that it must go to some regime in which, in which this is approximately valid. It will have to derive GR not as a, exactly valid. It will derive GR again as an approximation valid under separate, separate conditions. In this step of the relations, then you will have to cross something, at least in some regimes, in which... Okay, so this... This takes us to, to look, to take, uh, to view some classical gravity as an ana in analogy to, let's say, hydrodynamics. You have the Navier Stokes equations, which are very elegant equations. People have studied them. We know all sorts of the properties. They, you know in general how to find uh, solutions. And it, that, it describes fantastically well many situations. For instance, a wave in the ocean. So you describe a wave in the ocean using Navier Stokes equations, you have no problem. Except at the point the, gra the wave starts reaching the, the beach, there is a point where you already know there's there a breakdown, the, the wave produces cusps, where the equations do not longer hold, and eventually it will produce even the worst things, it will break and produce foam and produce all sorts of things that are not described by the navier stokes equations. And you're not surprised because you know the navier stokes equations are not the fundamental description of the fluid, they are just an approximate description of the fluid. This foam eventually dissipates and the wave returns back to the ocean smoothly and you are again in a regime in which the Navier stops fall. So we are going to take that lesson and apply it to our situation. We, what are we going to say? That semi-classical gravity is valid before a collapse. If we are thinking of a theory of individual collapses, things become much harder in a theory of continuous collapses, but let's start by the simplest thing. In, in a GRW type theory, if you have individual collapses, then the idea is that you will have a situation before the collapse occur, where you will apply semi-classical gravity, then the collapse occur and you are out of your the regime with your theory. But if this thing has not been really huge and dramatic, it's very natural that the thing after the, the collapse will be relatively close to the situation before the collapse. And then you try to match these two descriptions without requiring 
that on the collapse hypersurface something happened. Actually, you don't really believe it's going to be an hypersurface. You imagine some some intermediate step, like if you hit a if you hit a, a, a soccer ball, you know you can describe the position of the soccer ball in an approximation as static and suddenly boom, moving with the velocity after it was hit. In reality, you know that what you have done is you have reduced to an instant what was really a process that took some time. Your, your foot hit the ball, started the ball, to, the ball started to deform, your feet deform as well, and then the ball started to change its, uh, its motion, accelerated slowly and started. You, when you decide to compress all this story into a, in, in, into a single instant, then you have this quick jump. And this is all we're going to be trying to describe. So we idealize this process that may be a slow process or whatever it means because they don't have in that regime, I may not have even notion of time. I don't know what space time means there. I may not. <coughs> anyway, we, whatever is in, in, in between, we have idealized it and made it, made it into a single step. OK, so this idea we have. OK, so here, OK. When I give this talk to physicists, most physicists have never heard about the spontaneous collapse theories. So I tell them about, you know, GRW. I hope in this audience everybody has heard about spontaneous collapse theories and, you know, there is all this work. And the, the point of the theories is to address, to address you know, the, 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 the measurement problem, which, again, is the fact that we have these two evolution laws and we don't know, the theory doesn't tell us in a clear, in a precise uh, manner, what exactly is the situation under which one or the other should hold. And then I like to keep, uh, point uh, that when once you face this problem, there are basically three types of paths you can take, even by the, by the uh, analysis that the team did in, in, the, in this paper. And then you, we know, we all know that you are either uh, led to something like hidden variables, or, for instance, the problem with bomb theory, uh, theories that have uh, spontaneous collapse, uh, or things like many world interpretations. And the point is that in a recent paper that we have finished writing with uh, Thiemann, we are now trying try to get published uh, with Thiemann and Elias Kron, which is another colleague of mine. Uh, yeah, we're trying to get it published. Huh? Nothing. <laughs> We're trying to get it, we will get it published. We will get it published. So we concluded that within those three paths, there does not seem to be a general procedure by which you would be able to define an energy momentum tensor that is conserved. In none of the three paths, there seems to be really something that will produce what you want to put on the right hand side of Einstein's equations. Therefore, we should expect, you should expect that in any situation in which you have, you know, gravitational uh, physics interacting with quantum mechanics, you should expect deviations from, from GR. Uh, how can this connect with the standard views about uh, quantum gravity programs. Uh, well, there are various, the, 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 the first point is, is or well, the only point that I'm going to make is that there are open problems in, in, in even forgetting about all, all the technical difficulties of how to construct the quantum, uh, your, your quantum gravity theory. There are very serious problems of how to recover uh, standard notions of space-time. For instance, canonical theories of quantum gravity, you don't have there is no time, there is no notion of time, and it's called the problem of time. But more generically, we do, do not know even how to record, how to record space time from, from, from uh, canonical approaches and from several other approaches either. Uh, the, point <coughs> the point is that in analyzing this, this trying to deal with these two things, you are forced to start making approximations, start weighing your hands and, and, and doing all sorts of things that make you doubt that 
you are going to recover exactly, you know, GR with Schrodinger equation as, as a result. Uh, moreover, there are many indications that space-time might be an emergent phenomena, in other words, that there is some underlying dynamical logics, for instance, loop one to gravity could be one such idea, in which the space-time metric is not the object that needs to be quantized. There is some, nothing, something else that is the object that needs to be quantized. And this reinforces our view of GR, semi-classical GR, as some, something analogous to aerodynamics. But OK, let me not get more into that. OK, so how do you deal with the collapse of the wave function <clears throat> in one to three theory? So we, we, have, we have produced an R policy now, a, a, a general idea of how to implement this idea that you would have semi-classical GR before the collapse and semi-classical GR after the collapse. And the idea is, first of all, we define precisely what does it mean to have semi-classical GR. We call those what the constructions appropriate, we call it self-consistent configurations. And a self-consistent configuration is space-time. A quantum field theory construction, as I showed you the other day, which depends on that space-time, it is based on that space-time, you are supposed to be given space-time. The construction of a Hilbert space, where these objects act as an operator, and then the identification of a particular state in that Hilbert space, which we will call it the physical state, which is such that when you compute the Einstein tensor for this metric, that result is equal to the expectation value in that state of the energy momentum tensor of this quantum field theory construction. If you look at that carefully, you see that this thing is self has a self-referring stuff, right? Because, <coughs> well, let's see how it's self-referring. Imagine now that I want to collapse this state to something, something else. If I collapse the state, if I it jumps, forget about even the moment it can jump, I need to change, this quantity will change. But if this quantity changes, the space-time will change. But if the space-time changes, you need to construct, your construction is not longer valid. And the state to which you jump is not, cannot be called physical. So if you're going to jump, if you're going to consider a jump, you better jump the two things simultaneously in an inconsistent way. This, if, the, if the quantum state undergoes a jump, the space-time needs to undergo a jump, and in a way that is self-consistent, and you need to glue this two space types, and now you need a recipe of how to glue them, and we have already a one sketch recipe, and now we are working on really polishing this recipe and making it 100% precise. Okay? Okay. We have applied it, as I said, to, to some specific situations. Okay, so now let me <coughs> jump this This scheme that I have just written for you is probably the maximum you can get remaining within the semi-classical regime. Beyond, beyond, that reg beyond that regime, there may be regimes that are not describable by that, the same way that the foam was not described by hydrodynamics. Below that regime, when these collapses are very small, there must be effect some effective way to deal with this situation because that scheme that I just gave to you is, can deal with one collapse. I now want to consider a situation which is where I deal with a very large number of collapses. So that there must be a theory that is effective, or we hope that there is a theory that is effective, uh, and, that allows, and that allows the introduction of that. And that led us to <coughs> the observation that there is a modified version of GR in which energy momentum conservation is not so rigid, and that's called unimodular value. Okay. 
So what I want to emphasize here for you is this, you know, conceptual argumentation that leads us to look for such an object. Okay, so here it is. This is Einstein's equations. If the right hand side automatically vanishes upon the application of the divergence, that's called Bianchi identity, is a, is a analytic statement, it's, it's an identity. <clears throat> but therefore, the theory, the consistency of the theory requires that the left hand side satisfies that equation. Unimodular gravity. Unimodular gravity is very similar to Einstein's equations. Extremely similar, surprisingly similar. The main difference is that instead of here having one half, you have one quarter. And instead of having here nothing, you have again one quarter. In a sense, it's the traceless part of Einstein's equations. It's Einstein's equations without the trace. So there is one less equation than in Einstein's equation. This theory was considered by Einstein actually invented by Einstein and considered by Einstein. And normally when people work with that theory, <coughs> you assume as an extra independent assumption the conservation of the energy momentum tensor. But then it's clear that if you need to add this as an extra independent assumption, you may decide to explore the alternative. What happens if I now postulate that it does not satisfy conservation? So if not satisfied conservation, I'm going, to, I'm going to introduce this object I call J, which is basically the deviation from energy momentum conservation. And this theory is consistent with such deviations if this integrability condition holds. Let me not get too much into this issue. But the point is that if that integrability condition holds, then you can, uh, you can now add and subtract one, one quarter of J A B times R, and you have the term that is automatically zero because of the vanish, it has out, is automatically divergentless because of the Bianchi identity, and you have an equation for the rest, and the equation <coughs> the equation takes this form, and if it's under integrability conditions, then you can integrate that equation and it tells you that this particular combination is the integral of this thing, which is, if you want, the initial value that you may start in the infinite past, at the time you start your, your theory, plus the integral of this term. If you substitute now this thing into into the into the equation we had before, into, into this equation. So I add that equation to this equation. I end up with Einstein theory plus this object, which is this integral. In other words, if you look at the structure of this object, this object is appearing as something multiplying the metric. It's appearing as an effective cosmological constant, which is not really constant, right? Because this integral will depend on when you, the time at which you end it. But it's a constant. But, but it acts as a cosmological constant. Then this of opens very interesting possibilities. If you have an idea of what this divergence of the energy momentum tensor is, now you have a way to compute the cosmological constant, provided that you make some assumption regarding its original value. The cosmological constant problem, if you know the history, you know, the cosmological constant problem was introduced by Einstein when he found that his theory was incompatible with a static uh, universe. And at the time, they thought, well, the universe, everybody thought the universe is static, so I need to fix my theory. I add the cosmological constant. Several years later, they find the universe is not static, it's expanding. And then Einstein considered this was his great failure, his great lack of insight. 
putting this cosmological constant, he self regretted, I think all his life, I don't know too much about the history, but I know that he regretted for a long time having postulated uh, uh, such an idea. Uh, <coughs> But that idea <coughs> was uh, led to many other considerations. For instance, if you start with quantum field theory in curved space time, in curved space time and try to compute the energy of the vacuum in a direct way, putting a cutoff, which by the way violates Lorentz invariance, you get, and you think that at the Planck scale, you get estimates for this quantity that are wrong by 120 orders of magnitude. You could imagine that there was some principle that would set it to zero. And there were many, before it was, before, you know, 20 years ago or so, people were postulating all sorts of principles that indicated why the cosmological constant is zero, zero, absolutely zero. Hawking is the author of one famous paper, that's all. But okay. <clears throat> so zero is a natural number, and think something like, mass Planck scale, the quantity that, is, that has the correct dimensions and is set by the mass Planck scale, is another natural number. The big problem is the discovery in the last, what is 98? Oh, so now it's 21 years. The discovery 21 years ago that the universe is now currently accelerating and the value of this constant is 120 orders of magnitude smaller, it's not zero, but it's 120 orders of magnitude smaller than the natural expectation. So, how much do we want time? Uh, I think we do it at five. We're at five o'clock. Hmm. So, you know, we only go to six thirty or so. Oh, okay. No, you then fantastic. Fantastic because I am, I am doing fine. You're not under any time pressure right now. Good. Okay, so the point is that we have this very interesting possibilities. Actually, the first possibility we considered was to actually consider FRW. FRW is a theory that tells us how the energy momentum is not conserved. It gives an expression in terms of, of the density of matter, what's the rate at which energy relation occurs, and we have an idea of what is uh, going on, on in the universe. And if you think, well, I don't know how to apply it to extremely relativistic regimes, but at least I will apply it to the universe uh, starting from the point of hadronization, when the universe fills up with, pro with protons and neutrons and things like that. That seems like a natural place to, to, to start, considering the theory may be valid. And then you can then estimate, compute the contribution from the non-conservation associated with GRW, and surprisingly you get a number that is of the right order of magnitude. So that got us all excited, except the sign is wrong. Okay, then we started looking for other schemes for, uh, I mean, it could be that this is happening, but you need something else. That that by itself will only give you the wrong sign. Will give you the wrong sign. So uh, there is a there is a proposal for 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 some type of uh, violations. For, uh, well, and again, this this. Uh, this proposal also allows us to compute a, a number, and the, the number is fixed by some free parameters that are in the theory that are constrained by experiments to be, to be in certain ranges. And the interesting thing is that the contribution coming from here within those ranges also gives numbers that, that fit. But we decided that, this, that we needed something stronger. And stronger, I mean, I want to have a, a scheme in which I will not postulate any new constant that is dimensionful. And if I introduce a parameter, I'm going to introduce only one, and it's going to have dimension one. Sorry, it's going to have order one. It's dimensionless, it's not dimension, but that's, it's of order one. I don't want to introduce a fine tuned parameter. So one could be one over two pi, two pi, anything like that, fine not 10 to the 125 or anything like that, okay? So, we put together these two ideas. Non-conservation will be associated 
with these granular structures or the fates of space-time, which I like to think in, in a more general way than simply the grains of space-time. To me, the two things, you know, quantum aspects and gravitational aspects are tied at some intimate level, which I don't know what it is. So I would not distinguish that, for instance, from the flashes of a flash ontology. Okay? So these discrete structures may be the flashes. Or so let me not try to say any more. I imagine that there will be some granular features on the effects in space-time. Could be in a more picturesque thing the the edges of my plates that make up space-time, if you want. Anything of that sort. But I'm not going to be very specific about it. I'm just going to say this is granular. Its manifestation should be of a relational type. Should be of a relational type because of the lesson we learned already at the time where we considered granularity fixed type of preferential frame. So it should be relational and it should <coughs> appear when space time is curved. It would appear when space time is curved by matter. And it should be characterized by the way the probing matter is moving with respect to the matter that actually curves in space-time. We are going to add two other requirements. The granularity should have both mass, so that somehow you could think of what it would feel to be in its rest frame, and how it, in its rest frame it will feel the granularity. And it should have spin, so it will be able to tell in which direction the granularity is going. I, I think this is something that the team is not going to like very much because it looks like a very positivistic, uh, what? Logical positivistic approach to space time. But okay. <coughs> if you want to kind of discuss the fire. So, like, as I said, we don't have everything clear, but, but the point here is to produce a recipe of what are the elements that I can use as a recipe. Okay? This is producing me. So the recipe is the following. Model the, now the, the task is the following. Model a deviation from the geodesic equation. So the geodesic equation is the, the, the idea that this is zero. U is the four velocity parameterized by proper time of the world line of the particle. Model a deviation from geodesic motion, assuming it is controlled by curvature and is expressed in terms of the mass of the particle, the forward velocity of the particle, the spin of the particle, the vector field specifying how matter that produces the curvature is moving. Okay, so that's is going to introduce the relation between how your probe is moving and how the matter that is producing the curvature of space-time is moving. And nothing else. Those are the tools available to you. Once you decide those are the tools available to you, there is a constraint on what you can put on this side of the equation. It has to be a vector that is always perpendicular to you, because u is a vector always of magnitude 1. It's a unit vector. Right? It's the four velocity, it's always parameterized by proper time, so it's unit. So it better be a vector that is always perpendicular. Of, all, of the vectors that I have here, there is only one vector that has that property, the spin. The spin vector is the only thing that has this property. And now, dimensional analysis tells you what are the terms you can put. You know that you know the scheme better have something to do with, with, uh, with well, you want the curvature to appear, and now, and you want the mass to appear, and you and now we're going to you're going to put the term that is suppressed the least by, is associated with some aspect of quantum gravity, the reality. So this, <coughs> this particular term is the least suppressed term that you can write. You can write many other ones, but they are much more suppressed. So you can, you can you know, raise this to uh, power two, and then you put, you know, you uh, put mass plant to a higher so this is the least suppressed effect term. And, and it's 
unique, essentially unique. Very silly good. Okay. An interesting thing about this thing, which we, if you, you want, we are falling out of the lab by these requirements, is that it's very similar to things that appear in other, in other, in other considerations. One of them, one of the considerations is something completely classical, in which people, these, these guys, Matheson, Papapet, from Dixon and others, try to study what would describe the motion of the center of mass of an extended object in GR. The center of mass in GR is a complicated thing because the standard recipe for writing out the center of mass does not work, right? The standard recipe for the center of mass is take the position of the particles, multiply them by the mass, add them up, and divide by the mass. This recipe you cannot do it in, in special relativity. In particular, because the positions are not vectors, so you cannot add them up. The second thing is, you know, you don't want just to consider massive particles, because if you don't consider photons, then your, your center of mass will not move in a reasonable way when interacting with, with when you have photons involved. <clears throat> you need to weigh them by energy, but then if you have to weigh them by energy, energy in what frame? The whole thing becomes complicated, but there is a solution. There is a self-consistent solution to the control problem, and you can define a center of mass. Let me not get into the details of how you define a center of mass, but the point is that in the limit in which your object, in which you consider your object going to zero size, the motion of that center of mass is given by this equation. The reason I have P here not, and not U, I mean, I could have taken the mass out and divided. The reason that, that I don't do that is that the mass becomes also dependent on the, it's not a constant. The mass of, a, of an extended object is not constant in GR. Okay, but look at this equation, and look at this equation. They are, okay, what appears here appears something related to curvature, something related to the spin, if I took the mass out, there would be a mass in the, well, in this case, it would be in the denominator, but okay. So it's not, so it's kind of natural, if you want. Moreover, if you consider, if you consider a, a Dirac field, a Dirac, the Dirac equation, in a space-time work, there is torsion, and you look at the WKD approximation, which is basically trying to look at the behavior of plane waves and identify, identify the, uh, use the phases to identify the momentum and you divide by the mass to identify the, the velocity of some equivalent particle, that the, the equation that that object follows is this equation, which is again very, very similar to the equation we found uh, before. Okay. <clears throat> So this is to say that the expression that I gave you before is not completely crazy. There are other places where something similar happens. <clears throat> the other feature of this equation is this sign term. And the sign term is put there explicitly to ensure that the effect is dissipative. That when my particle interacts with these edges of the of the of this uh, rugged floor, it loses energy, doesn't, doesn't gain energy. And you can see that the dissipative character appearing, if you compute, you know, the energy that would be seen by an observer that, <clears throat> that moves with the commuting matter, with the matter that generates the, the, the curvature of space-time, the change of energy with time is given by this term, which is the standard term that appears due to the fact that this thing is generally not a tuning field, the non conservative standard non conservation of energy that appears in, in GR. I told you that in GR, energy is only conserved if you have a tuning field, if associated with a tuning field. So if the thing is not a tuning field, you're, you have a deviation from that. And the term that we, the term that arises from the term we introduced. There would be, because we're going, you don't, it doesn't look like, but we're extremely close to the end. I think the next, the next slide is the end of the story. Ah, no, one more. <laughs> <laughs> one more. 
It's okay. the end of the story in his <laughs> Well, the end of my short <laughs> story is <laughs> present. <laughs> okay, so we are now going to specialize in cosmology. Actually, to flood Robertson Walker space time, um, in which we can identify very simply the, this field that creates the matter. The matter, in that situation, the matter is, com is the moving matter is what's filling the universe, and the matter is following the integral lines of. The vector DDT. In other words, they have they, they move with all coordinates constant, and, and the only thing that is changing is t. And the only thing dynamical here is the scale factor. And I will far soon make an assumption that one of these protective symmetries that people involved when they were thinking that the cosmological constant is zero actually sets the initial value of the cosmological constant at remote Planck scale times to zero. I do that because I don't know the theory of quantum gravity, and zero is a natural number. Then I'm done. Then I'm done, because given this deviation, this modified, and I'm not going to show you the calculations, but calculations are straightforward. Given this equation, sorry, this equation, for how A particle deviates from from geodesic motion. I can compute this current, which indicates the violation of energy momentum conservation. So the my violation of energy momentum conservation involves my terms involves the temperature, because the temperature is an indication of the random motion, and it's only when the particles are moving with respect to this preferred frame, this special frame that there is any force at all. Um, this term involves the trace of the energy momentum tensor of the matter field, the spin of the matter field. And if I now concentrate on what are the things that contribute to strong power, and the trace of the energy momentum tensor, <coughs> if there is no cosmological constant or is, I can ne neglect that, is related directly directly related to curvature, and the term we are looking for is a term that is extremely small except at very late times in the universe. At the time where this is happening, where this is becoming relevant, the cosmological constant plays no role. The cosmological constant is now, today, around you know, twice the density of matter. But if you start moving down a little bit, you know, the cosmological constant is constant, and all these other terms grow very fast when you go into the, the past. So at the eras in the past, except the last few billion years, the cosmological constant is negligible. What we are going to compute is how it is generated. It's going to be generated, and then it's going to play no role, except after the universe undergoes a very, very large um, amount of, of expansion, and then, then it becomes observable, simply because the rest of the matter has diluted. But that only happened a few billion years ago. Okay? So during that time, I can neglect the effects of the cosmological constant and use just standard cosmology. In other words, because standard cosmology remains basically unchanged except for the last few billion years because the effects we are computing are this thing is negative. So then I relate the trace of the energy momentum tensor. The curvature and I have this expression, which is completely determined by the curvature of space-time. <clears throat> but I have to remember that all this is true only after particles acquire mass. Because the particles that were massless do not undergo any of this. Actually, the particles that are massless have zero trace of the energy momentum terms. The photon contributes zero to this one. Then I'm done. I'm going to concentrate in here in a special case in which the thing is dominated by a single fermion, and the, 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 it turns out that the heaviest fermion is the one that con contributes, a spin two uh, fermion. <coughs> and, <coughs> and in the actual calculation we do, we add the effects of other particles 
that are heavy, the particles that are that are the most heavy particles that we uh, uh, know of are <coughs> the Higgs particle, but the Higgs particle has no spin. The W and C bosons, they have masses of the order of 90, 80 GeV. And the top quark, that's the heaviest particle of the mole in the standard mode, which has a mass of 100 and something G. <coughs> so we're going to concentrate on, on, on the top quark. We will, in, in our calculation, we add the contributions from the other things, but they are small, actually small, end up being small contributions. And what I do is then compute the cosmology, the effective cosmological constant. I have now to do integrate this, this term, right? <coughs> which is the value of the curvature as a function of time. I have an expression for this for this uh, quantities in the situation of thermal equilibrium during the, during the, the universe. And I know where I start and when I end my integral, I start at the time particles acquire mass, which is the electroweak transition, and integrate until today. Okay, it turns out that in thermal equilibrium, this is the expression for this is the expression for this particular combination, rho minus 3p has this expression, and then I know this, the thermal history of the universe, I substitute for it. And then I end up with an expression for what is the value of the effective cosmological constant. It's a bunch of numbers, and basically it's determined by, by this combination. This is the mass of the top quark to the power 4, the electroweak temperature to the power 3, and mass plant to the power 5. This is the result. Now let's see what are those numbers. Electroweak scale is around, it's not, not known precise, electroweak transition, but it's around 100 GV. The, top, the top quark mass is around 115 or something like that, also around 100 GV. So let me simplify things and forget about the difference between these two numbers and simply put the mass of the quark, top quark to the power 7, the mass of Planck is to the power 5, I will add and add mass power mass Planck to the power two in the denominator and put it in the numerator and write this expression. And let's see what is the size of this expression. Well, this is mass Planck squared. This is the standard result you obtain for the value of the cosmological constant when you do, you know, the standard story that is wrong by 120 orders of magnitude. So this value is wrong by 120 orders of magnitude. What is this corrective number? Well, the top quark is 100 GV. This is 1, 10 to the 19 GV. This is number, this number is 10 to the minus 17 to the power 7, 10 to the minus 119. And you are, right, you are right there. Actually, with all, when you put all, the, all these factors, all the, all the 5 pi and blah, 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 it turns out that your prediction, if you set the electronic transition, the electronic scale at 90 GV, <coughs> your, your conclusion is that alpha should better be around 1 or 1.6 of 1.6, by the way, it looks very trusted like p over 2, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> alpha times the correct value of the cosmological constant. Okay? There is no fine tuning here. There is no fine tuning here. <laughs> what, 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 where do you see the fine tuning? Explain that. Sorry? Explain that a little bit. Why there is no fine tuning? I haven't said any parameter with uh, 20 digits to fit the number. It's the number of the row one. There's not absolutely no fine tuning. Fine tuning, normally you say, when you have to fix a number with, you know, extreme large number of digits and fix all the digits 
not here. There's there no fine tuning. I mean, if you want, there's less fine tuning in, than in Electro. In Electro, you have 1 over 137. What is that? You don't say that's fine tuning, right? <coughs> Okay, so I should have a graph here of what is the... Ah, you have it, okay. Anyway, if the only point here is that if you, for different values of the electroweak scale, you'll get similar parameters. So if you range the electroweak scale from 80 to 120, the range of alpha goes from some, something like 0 0.6 to 2, or something like that's 4. No, no problem whatsoever. So, the way it behaves, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the, I thought they had put the graph there. I, that. The, the way it behaves is here you have it's zero, here's the electroweak transition, it goes zoom. By the time, by the time your, your nucleosynthesis is already here, it has already saturated, so this occurs very, very early in, on in the, in the story of the universe, and then basically becomes a constant. And you would not observe it, there would be no effects of this thing until the universe has expanded, everything has diluted, energy, because as you know, if you look at the history of time, well, the, the, the matter, matter drops the energy density, sorry, so I should make clear what I'm talking about. So this is the density contribution of the density to the density of the universe as a function of time or of scale. And this quantity goes for for matter it goes like one over the scale to the cube. For radiation it goes like one over the scale to the fourth. And for the cosmological constant it doesn't so it's, it's, it's basic, completely negligible, negligible role until, well, apparently we are here right now. So the energy, the, the dark energy is around twice the matter density, and something like 10 to the 5 larger than the radiation density. And we were the first surprise to find that this number matches so beautifully. So that's all. So yeah, it's a cool results. Um, your stress energy tensor is a classical stress energy tensor from relativistic fluid. Yep. Okay, so in principle, this result might be compatible with the classical limit of, I don't know, like spontaneous collapse theories coupled to the unimodular field equations or a Well, there Well, there are now a version of collapse theory that I have not yet studied that include diffusion. Because one important thing is that ordinary collapse theories only create energy, right? Ordinary GRW creates energy. There are versions of GRW that have diffusion under certain conditions, they will diffuse energy. That's the kind of theory we would need. Yep. And, and um, in, in your result where you get the right magnitude of lambda but the wrong sign when you put in uh, spontaneous collapse with yep. semi-classical yep. Einstein equations or uh, with the well, other constraints? Let me be more precise. <laughs> there, is a there is a range of parameters for the GRW mm -hmm. and we a number within that range would fit the cosmological constant, but of course we have a range. Right. So, so is there a physical argument you can give for why the sign is wrong? Why well, the yeah. Why collapses give the wrong sign? Co collapses create energy. Yeah. And and in, in my equation, you'll see that the, that, that, the, that the cosmological constant, if you want to think about it in this way, you can imagine in this way. Let me look at the, at the equation, so the equation in which we look at how things are. So things, if you want, energy momentum is passing from, from here to here, right? Because it's passing from this side of the equation to this side of the equation. So here, 
If I'm going to add positively to this guy, I better add negatively to this, to this guy. So in other words, this, of this part of the story, this part of the story has to have divergence zero. Because it's equal to the Einstein story. So. so would you expect the same result? This problem to come out with, uh, say, a Bohmian field? I, I, a couple of easy to modular equations with the. I, 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 know, I know little about Bohmian. I know that they generally they, they don't have an energy momentum conservation, they don't have energy momentum conservation. I don't know too much about what the generic sign is. Uh, I, I don't know enough to say what it would have. It would be very interesting to, to try to do, to do Bohmian mechanics uh, with only unimodular. I think I leave that to the people that know how to do Bohmian stuff. So can you say a little bit more why the theory you're invoking loses energy revenue? Like I talk about the TRW theory, I, I kind of understand why any theory like that would have to increase energy because it's narrowing the rate packets and stuff like that. So what, 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 how do you understand what's going on that you're losing energy? No, but here, here, here it is. I'm not even going to try to say what is the fundamental okay. reason why it's losing energy. The, the kind of thing we have in, our, in the back of our mind is this granular structure. Space-time is somehow granular. There are grains in space-time, and when you move through these grains, somehow these grains absorb, absorb, absorb energy from the particle. You're scattered from the grains absorbing energy. Okay, the, the, so the, 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 the grains itself are, are I guess, taking up energy. Yeah, but the grains could be, you know, the pointer field of a theory like Bellingham's, the, 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 the flashes of... I, I don't want to commit myself now. The, one interesting point here is that we didn't put any parameters, any unknown parameters. GRW has these two parameters, right? The rate, the, the, the rate and the... And, and, and the sorry, the, the width, the width, the width mm -hmm. right? So, here we didn't have to put parameters. So I would expect that if this comes from a theory of that sort, it would be a theory that would realize, if you want, the, the, the Penrose, the OSI type of scheme in which you, it would not be new parameters that produce mm -hmm. the things. On the other hand, uh, the theory has to be substantially revised because we are talking here with a scheme in which I'm talking and dealing with highly relativistic. Actually, what I would really like is to be able to write a theory that produces this at the level of quantum field theory. At the level of quantum field theory, the collapse dynamics needs to be dramatically changed. It's not in position space, it's in something else. As I was suggesting the other day, perhaps it's in something like the energy momentum tensor itself that collapse is occurring. And then I don't know if it creates energy or overhead, right? So, so I'm I, I'm not committing myself to any of those things here. Why, given this other paper we just wrote, why are words like, oh, the energy is being absorbed by the grains or you know, it's really Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's, it's, it's not. It's not. It's not. Good it's it's not you get away from that hole. Yeah, it's, it's not. Hole. It's not. It's, 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 it's very bad word. Given the paper we have written, I agree. It's a word that to physicists would, yeah. would communicate the intuition of what's going on. Here, I also said, look, here I also said in this, in this way, energy is flowing from here to here. But in order to say energy is flowing from here to here, even when, when we talk about friction, you imagine that there is really something there that absorbs the energy and that, and that keeps the energy. And energy is maintained there. Here, there is nothing of that sort. So, so Tim is right in correcting me. And sometimes I try to speak the language, and, and by trying to speak the language, I. So we should really be thinking of not that the, this, these great grains are, are absorbing the energy, but the energy really isn't conserved. It's, it's just being. Yeah, yeah, I like to think this okay. way. I like to think this way. Because I don't like to think that they, there are grains that even that perfect. Look, for a grain to absorb the energy, 
it will have to be permanent, the grain itself. And if the grains are flashes, the flashes are not permanent. You have a flash and it's gone, so you cannot conserve the energy. The energy that is taken, if you want, again, right. violated. If, it, if you want to say that when something lost energy scattering, it was taken by the grain, well, then the grain is gone. Can this, so in, in cosmology you take this equation and minus your special bit and you turn it into the Friedman equation with the rods of all the metric. Yep. Is there a story we can tell in that sort of framework? Yep. Because if you say matter is losing energy, that does sort of create a cosmological constant each term. But it's not matter's kinetic energy, it's its mass energy that you've got to lose. You've got to You've got to destroy particles or something like that. It's not its pressure term, it's its energy density. Here, well, the cosmological constant, cosmological constant is very important and has affects both density and pressure. Because yes. it's only then that you can have it being something like a constant, right? It's, it's only because of that. The pressure term is very important in the in, in the thing. So it's, if not, it's not going to be. If, if you just if you just get rid of of energy density and, and you do not nothing to the, with the pressure, you are not going to create a cosmological constant. You're going to create. No, a I mean, you can't, you, once you start messing with, um, but but the, 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 the energy creation terms and the freedom rules of all you can do that. You, 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 once you no. <laughs> once, once energy conservation is gone, it's kind of limited. This equa this equa the, the, those equations are this equation, right? Yeah, the yeah, zero yeah. zero term, the zero zero term in the particular cosmological metric is, yeah. you know, is this equation. So yeah, okay. We might have to dig into the Friedman equation. Yeah, it is. It, it, no. Project project. You have homogeneity and isotropy in yeah. cosmology. Project this once into the into the. Uh, Twice into the into the normal, yeah. and you get you know Friedman equation. Look at the terms on the like the on, on project twice into, into any direction. You get the other three the other three that are identical because of is uh, is a problem. Okay. So it is it, it is the same. Right? Yeah, I'm just wondering how to tell about tell the story within the Friedman. Just project this equation. Yeah. yeah. Just project this equation. For my sort of physical intuition of what's going on here, there are two relevant variables: of mass and spin. And mass is sort of get. Why spin? Look, I need to tell you in which <coughs> direction. Where's my? Where's my? Okay, here's my equation. I'm going to tell you that this that this this is the rate of change of the vector u when you move with it. This, this you can imagine as, you know, what does an observer that moves with the four velocity u see to be the change in the vector u? That's what this geodesic, the geodesic equation does. And, and the geodesic equation is, it doesn't change, right? Now I'm going to tell you that this vector u has to change in one direction. Which direction are you going to choose it for it to change in? It better be a direction that is perpendicular to u, because u, by definition, has normal, to, has, you know, magnitude one. So if you change u in in anything that has component along u, the question doesn't make sense, right? So what am, among these vectors? Well, if you put it in the direction u, it's backwards the direction. This vector generically has components in the direction u. Actually, it has a very large component because u is time-like, this vector is time-like, they are not perpendicular. But there is a natural vector, there is one vector that tells you a direction. Spin. It's the only vector that is always perpendicular to... By the way, this equation must be accompanied by an equation of how the speed changes. Okay? So that's something we're working on. 
because this equation is not consistent unless S changes also in a particular way so that it remains perpendicular to you. Okay? So you have to mod so the equation that tells you how the spinable also needs to be modified. Actually the spin equation has some ambiguities. And, but we're working on we're working on that on that part of the story. That is important. The, sorry, did I clarify your question? Yeah. <coughs> this lower uh, equation, this older equation, it, it has a spin as a tangent. Yep, spin as a tangent. Uh, in, 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 in GR, you, 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 you describe this as a tangent. Yes. Is the generator of the is the generator of the Lorentz group? Okay, so it has two indices. <coughs> If the Lorentz group involved includes the rotations. And you cannot look at something relatively, you cannot just look at the rotation group by but you want to look at the whole the rotation group is part of the Lorentz group. So the generators that you want to look at are the generators of the Lorentz group. Those are the those are these that's the generators of the Lorentz group for the internal degrees of freedom, this spin. Uh, uh, Could also 
um, put that on a lattice, right? Or use simplicial lattice discretization of the metric and then solve the equations on the lattice and would you get the okay. same result? I don't, I don't know how to do that. First of all, will I have conservation of the energy moment in that, sir? I don't know. I don't know. I know mean, this is what, for example, Luke Hunter is trying to do for Cosmos House. I mean, because Cosmos Deck will try to do And people are still trying to work out the patch. No, there are, many, there are many puzzles, there are many issues that, you know. For instance, one issue that is, we're very interested in, and Kirkwood by lately, and I was telling this with the astronomer colleague here, uh, is apparently the value of the cosmology, the value of the Hubble parameter today that you extract from best fit analysis to the supernovas, and the, and the one that you obtain from looking at the CMB are different now. And they are different by something that apparently is substantial. It's, much like, it's claimed to be much larger than the uncertainties. It could be that it's just a fluke and it will go away, but I don't know. What, can you tell me how many sigmas are? Is the, I think it's about three. There is currently a conference going on where a whole lot of possible. Okay, yes. So what we had was a CMB probability data, and then a essentially variable one, and then another data uh, it came and landed right in the middle and helped us all out by not deciding at all. But <laughs> those two on the edge, um, the the CMB one has always been pretty sharp, and that's what we've been going with for quite some time. And then the blue one has been sharpening up over recent Years, um, Adam Reese doing a lot of work there and just sort of, yeah, and not landing on the same place. Okay. Um, and this is now the reason they in between. Um, yeah. So, so there's something I've been following on Twitter, a, a conference. Which so, is, so it's like <laughs> something of the rough side, six percent difference between the two. Values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and um, I think the uncertainties are of the order of. Of the two on the outside, we were getting sort of three, four sigma. Three, four sigma, okay. So sometimes at three sigma, you're yeah, told to start yeah. taking it. Well, I don't know, let me not get into that, but we are now very interested in seeing if there is something natural we can say using this scheme about that. It would be interesting. We could. Because we're desperately looking for other calculation. I mean, we have a calculation that fits, but of course, okay, yes, we are surprised, we are happy and surprised, but okay, we need, normally need more to start believing seriously that this is, is the answer, right? We would like to have some other effect that we can point out and see and look, and this is correlated with that, and this is the then we would be in good shape, very, very good shape. So you, you got up there and otherwise free particle deviates from the adhesive motion. Is there any prospects for more direct evidence of that? So I think in the trajectory, orbital dynamics of both matter, like galaxies and things, or? The problem, the problem is this parameter. Curvature generically is extremely small. Okay. So you are going to have a large effect Either where curvature is large, which is very interesting anyway, but these environments are not you know, are not all are not all around. Or when you have something like it has happened here, because the effect is extremely small. Even for those particles at that energy, they're losing a incredibly small proportion of their energy. The only reason this effect is is that it accumulates over the whole history of the universe. Right? It accumulates. It's a, tiny, it's a bunch of tiny things happening to a, basically to all the matter in the universe for some period of time. So, so you need this one of these two things to, to really enhance the thing to produce. So, or alternative, you need alternative. You can look for high precision experiments, very very high precision experiments. So, for instance, a photon is not going to be affected 
because the photon has zero mass. But the neutrino may be affected, and neutrinos travel long distances. Okay. Unfortunately, neutrinos are very, very small mass. So it's going to be a very, 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 very small effect. <laughs> 